You may have heard recently in the news about Apple deciding to use sapphire glass instead of Gorilla Glass. I thought it would be interesting to look into the two products and get an idea of what the differences are and some of the manufacturing techniques behind the production of both Gorilla Glass and Sapphire Glass. So I'm going to talk today about two different topics. One is how are each one of these products made and then the second topic relates to their property differences. What are the advantages and disadvantages of using one over the other? So let's first start with Gorilla Glass. Gorilla Glass is a true glass. It's composed of an alkali aluminosilicate material. Uh, it contains primarily sand or silicon dioxide. It also has other smaller elements within it, including aluminum and magnesium and some others, but the primary component is that of silicon dioxide. And the production of Gorilla Glass starts really with he, um, heating up this silicon dioxide to greater than a thousand degrees Celsius until it turns into, of course, a molten liquid. At that, at that point, um, the glass panels are produced in a very interesting proprietary fashion. Corning apparently developed this process for creating sheets of glass without having to cut these thin sheets. And the proprietary process is called a fusion draw process. Um, this is a screen capture from one of their videos. And uh, what you're doing, or what you're looking at, <clears throat> is uh, essentially a long trough. You're looking at the end of a long trough, not unlike a gutter, um, that is filled with uh, molten glass. And you can see here on this dark orange on the outside of the glass is actually molten glass that's flowing around it. So the process is filling this, this trough up with molten glass and continuing to fill it so that it overflows the side of the trough, runs down on both sides, and then meets at the bottom where you can see this line. Well, it's not actually a line. Uh, because it's a long trough, it's actually a sheet, a molten sheet of liquid glass. And um, what the, the process includes grabbing the sheet and pulling it. And by pulling it at a particular rate, faster or slower, you can make the sheet of glass either thinner or thicker as it cools. So the combination of the proper temperature and the proper flow rate and how quickly or slowly you pull that molten sheet of glass, you can create a thinner or thicker sheet of glass. So at this point, you have a nice thin clear sheet of glass, uh, but you now have to strengthen that glass. And uh, the way you do that is, uh, is by tempering it. And this is a slight tangent because I also found this quite interesting. Uh, of course, the, the, the definition of tempered glass is essentially glass that's very strong. And there are a couple of different methods for making tempered glass. One is thermal temp te tempering, and the second is ion exchange tempering. The uh, Corning, the Gorilla Glass uses the latter uh, uh, method, that is ion exchange. I'm just going to briefly explain thermal temp tempering as well. But in either method, the goal is the same. What you want to do is create, on the surface of the glass, you want to create compressive forces. 
and in the center of the glass you want to create tension and this is the underlying principle behind tempered glass. Um, there's a really a very dramatic and fascinating demonstration of this property um, on, the, on the web. The, the item or, or rather the, uh, the object that's created with this method is called Prince Rupert's Drop. It's actually a teardrop shaped uh, piece of molten glass that's dropped in water and is cooled rapidly and it creates this property in this teardrop shaped glass that has this these compressive forces on the surface and the distractive forces in the center. If you Google Prince Rupert's Drop and Smarter Every Day, you'll come up with a fantastic uh, visual demonstration of this, uh, a demonstration that includes uh, a really high frame rate uh, fracturing of this glass. So I would encourage you to go see it. Anyway, that's that's thermal tempering, which I just described with this Prince Rupert's Drop. Um, Gorilla Glass is made with the other method, that is the ion exchange. And once again, uh, the picture I have here is a screenshot from their uh, video on their website. <clears throat> and uh, what I have here in this uh, screenshot is a schematic of the piece of glass. So this gray line here sort of defines, uh, this line defines the surface of the glass, and this is the edge. The line I have here, the line, the red line I've drawn here, defines, roughly speaking, the surface of the glass versus the more central portion of the glass. Anyway, you take these sheets of glass that you have uh, uh, created with this fusion draw process, and, and uh, you immerse them in a 400 degrees Celsius potassium salt bath a very high temperature bath. And <clears throat> what happens at the microscopic level is that, or at the atomic level, uh, is that uh, the sodium ions in the surface of the glass are replaced by the larger potassium ions. The potassium ions here are represented by the yellow circles and the sodium ions are represented by the dark gray circles. You can see in the surface portion of the glass, you can see there's a relative preponderance of potassium, and in the deeper layers, there remains a preponderance of, of sodium. And effectively, because potassium is a larger atom than sodium, when this, when this cools, this creates a, a highly compressive force or forces in the surface of the glass and uh, relative tension in the center, central portion. Again, creating what's called um, tempered glass. And this, this really creates the uh, hardness and the resistance to the scratch resistance. So that's how, generally speaking, you make Gorilla Glass. So let's move on to Sapphire Glass. Well, Sapphire Glass is a little bit of a misnomer. It's not really glass. It's not made of sand it's actually made of crystalline aluminum oxide and the aluminum oxide is the same stuff that makes up the jewelry sapphire of course sapphire has different colors and that's due to various impurities in the in the uh, aluminum oxide crystal um, but for purposes of uh, production of clear sapphire it's essentially pure aluminum oxide what you do in general, as you heat the, this aluminum oxide to a very high temperature, about 2200 degrees Celsius, and then you slowly cool the aluminum oxide over actually a two-week period. So it's a very, very slow cooling process. Um, after you do that, you get, of course, a big block of aluminum oxide. And here is an example of one that's been created. Uh, they call these large blocks of aluminum oxides boules, a boule of crystalline aluminum oxide. And then of course now that you have a boule you have to go on and uh, you have to 
of course, cut it and create the sheets, uh, thin sheets of of uh, of uh, thin sheets that you want to put, for example, on a cell phone. Um, so how do you how do you cut sapphire glass? Well, turns out, and I'll explain this later. Sapphire glass is extremely hard. It's actually harder than gorilla glass. Um, and uh, about the only thing that's harder than sapphire is uh, diamond. And so uh, you cut these things with uh, diamond blades uh, into very thin slices. Uh, and that's sort of been the, the usual technique for, for cutting uh, this glass. However, um, more recently, a new technique was developed by a company called Twin Creeks, and they essentially use a hydrogen accelerator. And, and the method for creating these thin plates of a sapphire or sheets of sapphire is that you, you cut a very flat surface uh, off this bool, and then you bombard the surface with a very carefully controlled hydrogen ion carefully controlled with respect to its energy level. And by doing that, the hydrogen ion penetrates at a very precise depth. So given depth, excuse me. So given a particular energy level, the hydrogen ion precisely deposits at a at a depth into the surface of the sapphire glass. You then take the glass and you place it in a furnace and the hydrogen ions, or the hydrogen expands into gas and the and it shears off a layer of of um, of sapphire. Uh, I believe the number that they gave was something like 20 microns. So they penetrate the hydrogen about 20 microns into the sapphire glass, heat it up, and it shears off these 20 mil 20 micron thick layers of sapphire glass. So now that we've talked about the production methods for both these materials, what about their property differences? Um, well, the first one I want to talk about is hardness. And uh, hardness, as I'm sure you know, is typically scored with the Mohs scale, talc being the softest and having a value of 1, and diamond the hardest, having a value of 10. Sapphire glass comes in at nine, so diamond is essentially the only naturally occurring substance that is harder than sapphire. Gorilla glass uh, measures about 6.8, which is about the hardness of quartz. Sapphire glass is heavier, uh, that is, it uh, weighs more for the same volume of glass. Um, gorilla glass is more translucent than uh, sapphire glass, marginally so. Um, and then the other issue with sapphire, the other significant issue is its breakability. Sapphire breaks more readily than Gorilla Glass. This is, I think, a complicated question to really answer uh, because it depends on uh, how you measure uh, the breakability. One of the standard methods for doing it is to place uh, the same thickness of sapphire and gorilla uh, into a device that has different size rings and compress the glass between these two rings until they break and measure the weight at which that fails. Um, the One of the issues is that that failure of either substance in part relates to how many scratches are present on the surface. In other words, failure does often occur where scratches have developed. And since sapphire is much more resistant to scratches, would that mean that the overall fracture rate might be lower than, say, Gorilla Glass? I don't know the answer, but I think that's an interesting um, issue that I'm sure Apple has addressed. 
um, sapphire is more expensive to produce. Um, Corning claims that it costs up to 10 times more, though uh, Apple has a couple of foundries, I believe, that's producing this. And um, certainly with a larger or more extensive production, the price will very likely drop down. Um, so uh, the other issues that might affect sort of real world behavior of these two is in reference to the thickness used of Gorilla versus Sapphire. Even though Sapphire might be denser, they might be able to use a thinner uh, sheet of the material, therefore not add any significant weight. Um, the other issue that, that Apple may do is create a glass sapphire laminate so that it gets some of the properties of both um, to sort of get the hardness of sapphire but more of the durability of glass. And um, as I mentioned before, um, perhaps the scratch resistance would actually improve the fracture risk. I don't know that for sure, but I'm postulating that. Um, on that note, I think, I hope you've um, now understand a little bit better some of the differences and manufacturing techniques with respect to Gorilla Glass and Sapphire Glass. Thank you.